Hi, this is Chad Walber with PCB Pizzatronics, and I'm about to discuss with you uh, the very basics of performing sound power measurements. Um, just to give you a little background on myself, uh, this is all of my basic information. Uh, I've got about 10 years of expertise doing dynamics, testing, instrumentation setup, field testing, acoustics measurements, calibrating. Um, I've been working for PCB Piezotronics at this point about three years. Uh, I have a PhD in mechanical engineering and uh, I am currently uh, sit on a couple of standards committees, uh, the IEC Electroacoustics Committee and Microphones. And I'm also the chair of the ASA Standards Committee on uh, microphones. So, and I have a couple papers down here below if you want to peruse and look at those later. So, what we're going to talk about today a little bit. Uh, I'm going to split this up into two parts. Uh, the first part will be basic acoustics, go through the definitions, uh, description of what the difference between waveform propagation and particle motion is, different types of sound fields, both from the point of view of the receiver and from the source, and a, just a quick discussion of what octave band analysis is. So let's jump right into it. Definitions. Uh, sound is any mechanical wave that is a pressure wave through the medium, uh, whether it's solid, liquid, or gas. Um, there are other types of waves, uh, but we're strictly talking about mechanical waves. Electromagnetics is also a type of wave, but that's motion of photons, not actual atoms in a medium. Um, the study of sound, the whole umbrella study of sound, is acoustics. And that includes vibes, that includes ultrasonics, that includes uh, Psychoacoustics, there's many, many disciplines, sub-disciplines of acoustics that talk that are not just in engineering, but also in architecture, in psychology, uh, in medicine. In medicine, you have audiometry. And so there's many different people are affected and study acoustics, even though they may or may not be engineers. And noise, the last description we have here, is any sound or signal that is unwanted by the receiver. Which, the interesting part about that definition, and that's a definition straight out of signal processing, uh, that defini definition states that it's unwanted, so it's a completely subjective term. Uh, so what is one man's noise is another man's music, as the saying goes. Acoustic metrics. So what are we talking about? These are the things that we actually measure in acoustics when we care about different, uh, when we talk about analyzing the medium. Uh, the first and foremost, and pretty much all the basis of all the measurements here, is sound pressure, which we measure typically with a microphone or a pressure transducer. Uh, the basic sound pressure unit is the Pascal. And from there, all of the other measurements you see down here on this page, particle velocity, sound power, and sound intensity, are derived or calculated from measurements of sound power. Uh, particle velocity is the particle in the medium as it gets transported back and forth. Think of it as the bouncing around of the particles back and forth. And we'll see a slide. The next slide kind of goes over that a little bit more. Sound power, and that's the main topic of what we're what our little presentation here is right now, is a measure of the sound energy per unit time. It's measured in watts and can be computed as sound intensity times area. Now the way we actually measure it is using sound pressure and that gets into a couple of equations, a little bit of math. It's not heavy, but I'll talk about it in the second section. And then sound intensity is actually used uh, as, an, uh, as a combination of sound power and particle velocity. And simply put, it's the sound power per unit area. Uh, t technically, we as humans, uh, with our ears, we have two ears, we use sound intensity. And the, the interesting part about that is sound intensity is a vector quantity, meaning not only does it have a, an amplitude, but it also has direction associated with it. So as you see on this slide, the overall motion of the wave is slowly going all the way across the screen. You can see my little laser pointer just kind of moving around like that. And this wave will progress all the way down the tube. And you see these little red dots here. 
this is the, the the actual velocity of these red dots as they bounce back and forth. You see, they're not they're not actually moving anywhere. That velocity of those little red dots here, here, and here uh, are what we measure as the particle velocity. And again, we derive particle velocity with the sound po sound pressure measurements. Uh, the speed of sound in a medium is fixed based on what the what the current phase state of the medium is. That means if the temperature changes or the density changes in the medium, your sound their speed of sound will also change. Um, and you see down here just the very basics of dry air, 20 degrees C, uh, 343.2 meters per second. That's definite. That's that's the basis of which most of our uh, acoustic measurements we assume that we're going our, our speed of sound is there there are some times we need to get things a little bit more accurate so we actually measure our environmental parameters and we'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a minute here when we get to the actual meat and potatoes of sound power measurements but um, for the most part we just we make that assumption right off the bat so I'm going to talk about the acoustic field type uh, at least from the point of view of the microphone, since I work with microphones, uh, the receiver is what I care most about. So we talk about acoustic field types according to free field, which is a completely complete lack of reflections. The primary direction of the sound source and the action of the microphone are collinear. And there's only one sound source. That's very important in a free field. You're talking about one microphone measuring one source. In a diffuse or random incident field, you could have multiple sources, any direction, with any amount of reflections or hard surfaces or even absorption coefficients on the different surfaces in the room. And then the last type of microphone is kind of not useful in here, which is the pressure microphone. Think of it as a, a glorified pressure transducer that can measure acoustics. Uh, typically, a pressure tr pressure microphone is only used for transfer calibrations from one type of calibration to another, and uh, for the most part, just think of it as a as a glorified pressure transducer. However, when we're talking about the source of acoustics, uh, the the various like lawnmowers, vacuum cleaners, various types of apparatus that produce sound. We're, we want to talk about the acoustic field field shape according to the source. And when we talk about that, again, we're talking about a free field. And we have a source in an anechoic room or outdoors with a reflecting plane. And there's nothing to reflect sound or at least a surface that's absorbing as much sound as you can. And again, only one sound source can exist. And But if you see in this picture here, there's multiple microphones. So those microphones, if they're free field microphones, are pointed right at the source. If they're random incident microphones, they are angled slightly away from the source. And actually, if you read through the standards, and we'll talk about that in a minute, how the proper angle to point the microphones at with respect to the source. When it comes to diffuse field testing, uh, the acoustic field type and shape according to the source, you're talking about a room that is very hard surfaces, random angles for allowing the reflection of the sound. The concept for measuring sound in this room is that it's very, it's a very live space. You've got a lot of echoes, you've got a lot of reverberations. And the interesting part about this room, you usually you can measure multiple sources at once. Uh, most of the time in the sound power standards, you're required to only measure one source and then derive everything else based on that source. And we'll talk about that in the next section. Sometimes you can't actually take your piece of equipment or your source into a special environment. And in that case, when it's a big machine or you need special types of power or you need something special that doesn't allow you to take the source into uh, one of the, either the anechoic room or the reverberant room, you do an in situ sound power measurement. Um, the actual environment where the source exists, and you get, you have to perform several corrections in this room in order to make it work properly. And again, no room is perfect. Some anechoic rooms are going to have reflections. 
some reverberant rooms are going to have absorption and every room in between those two has some amount of absorption or reflection and you have to take that into account when you're taking your measurements now i talked about the acoustic field type with respect to just what the source sees and what your receiver sees but now the relationship between the two of them is also very important uh, when you're talking about near field versus far field now the, the terms are described down below and the distance away from a particular source is important because as you get closer and closer to a very complex source let's take a car engine a, a v6 engine if you put the microphone an inch away from the engine you're gonna be hearing sound resonating off of different uh, elements of the body. You've got your different manifolds, you've got fans, you've got liquid flowing, you've got cylinder explosions. All of those things are coming from different directions. So with respect to the source, it's seen sound from multiple directions, but the engine itself is considered one source. Uh, when you get into the far field, that's when your sound source looks like it's a point source, meaning all of the sound is coming from one place. It's a it's a direct vector from the center of whatever you're trying to measure to whatever you're measuring with. And you can see in this plot here, you've got this sweet spot here. This portion where you're not in the near field, you're in the far field of the particular source. But as you get closer to the walls of whatever room you're measuring in, you start to get reverberations. Now in a reverberant room, this line here goes all the way right up to the near field. And so this entire range here will be reverberant. But when you're doing sound power in an anechoic room, uh, you want this sec to be right in this section here where you're getting your minus six dB. So that's a six dB decrease in sound pressure per doubling of distance. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit of octave band analysis. Uh, some of you may be familiar with frequency responses in FFTs that's linear or constant frequency width bins. Octave band analysis is, derives from the fact that an octave is a doubling of frequency. And whole octaves are way too big to do true analysis. So we divide it up into one-third, one-sixth, or one-twelfth octaves. The smaller the fraction, the smaller the range of the particular bin, and the more bins you have over the entire frequency range. Human acoustics ranges from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So you see the list of octave band bins here goes all the way down to uh, 22 kilohertz here is the very top of the top whole octave band range and even if you go down here you can measure even higher bins if you want to. That's the end of part one of Sound Bauer Basics. A quick discussion of the basic terms that you will need to know in order to perform a sound power test. The next section will go into more depth of the specific sound power standards and how to perform this, the measurements according to the standards.